Hello everyone, welcome to a chapter of day with Miss Petals. I'm Miss Petals and <laughs> yes, I know, I need to speak louder. I'm a little bit nervous, sorry y'all. Um, where a chapter a day keeps ignorance at bay and imagination at play. So as you may have noticed, I am a little bit nervous because <laughs> this is my first live. Um, but before we begin, I want to say to all of you first timers like me, you know, we get nervous. Like what if nobody likes what we do or nobody watches and we're not that interesting? Listen, I had to learn like I've, I've been scared for like weeks preparing for this and wondering if anybody was going to pay attention or anybody was even interested. But listen, listen to uh. Let me share some words of encouragement from the people from my uh, from my uh, family and from my uh, my best friend who is sitting and watching me and listening to me right now that you need to be the change you want to see. So whatever you do is been is people will be watching. But hey, if nobody's watching you. You've always got Jesus Christ looking at you <laughs> like and he's always watching. So you already got a fan watching you. And no, I'm not trying to do this for clout. I had, I just learned. I just found out what that word means. And that means trying to be famous. No, I'm actually wanted like this whole channel, which is sponsored by the Seeds of Harvest Library, located in 4121 Cleveland Street, Gary, Indiana. Um, we, of course, it's a library and I do a lot of story times on this channel. And I have to give all credit to God that he brought this book to my attention to read. And it's one of my favorites. And it, we will be reading a chapter of day of Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Now I'm sorry um, if my video is lagging. I've noticed that it's like 12 seconds long. I don't know if it's, uh, that's how live stream is. And uh, if you guys are commenting, um, please forgive me if I don't read them right away because I'll be reading. But um, why Fahrenheit 451? Well, there's all, uh, a lot of talk nowadays about how our current world is often compared to George Orwell's 1984 or uh, we think of it as heading towards a dystopian society but we don't a lot of people don't even know what dystopia means or what a dystopian society is um, Fahrenheit 451 is an example of one and let me pull up but in my own words a dystopian society is a society that is the opposite of a utopia and a utopia is something that's ideal like there's no uh tr tyrannical rule there's no bad there's all good heaven <laughs> whereas a dystopian society is one of strife one of government uh rule one of control uh dictatorship hell <laughs> it's basically hell um but according to which i pulled up from wikipedia a dystopia is a fictional community or society that is undesirable or frightening Dystopias are, are, are often characterized by rampant fear or distress, tyrannical governments, environmental disaster, or other characteristics associated with a cataclysmic decline. I personally, why, so basically when people think of dystopia, they always go to Fahrenheit for, I'm not, George Orwell, I'm sorry. George Orwell and but they always forget about Fahrenheit 451 uh, whenever I bring it up to people I forget 
that well I don't forget but like they forget that this book actually which was my first dystopian novel this book talks about censorship and what's going on right now is a lot of censorship and a lot of things are being censored right now as you all know but I think we should talk about this book and a lot of people don't really think about Fahrenheit 451 because you know they think well that's about a firefighter who burns books books are still around but yeah but how much longer I mean we got ebooks now of course but it takes the reading away you know like I w recently I went to a visited a library and there was no one there but there was all kind of advertisements say hey uh you can get free books off of ebooks but what's the point of going to the library then you know what I'm saying and whether we like it or not slowly and but surely libraries are dying right now they literally are and as a librarian myself I get a lot of questions about what is a library and how does it work which is scary to me <laughs> you know because like I grew up in a generation where it was exciting to go to the library like we loved going to the library but now it's now I'm seeing a generation that doesn't even know what it is or and are glued to the iPad and stuff and anything electronical I don't even see kids playing to with toys anymore it's always an iPad but anyway um Let's talk a little bit about the setting of the book. It takes place in the 50s. So we have to set our minds. I know we're in 2021, but we got to go set our minds to 1950, the 50s. And during that time, television had just come out. And thus was the inspiration for Ray, for Ray to make this, his novel. I know some of you are probably like, oh, I want to read already. So you can, once you get, you can just flash forward through this when it's a video. But I know, I also want to shout out to all these college students who have to read it and high school students who have to read it because I know y'all don't want to pay extra for books and I can help you out. <laughs> I know the struggle. <laughs> so today we're going to be reading chapter one. And we're going to talk about what we read. And let's get to it, y'all. Imagine TV just coming out. I mean, I can't imagine because I always had it. <laughs> I've always had it. But I can say I remember when the internet came out and when YouTube came out and when the iPhone came out back in 2008. <laughs> But imagine the TV first coming out. It's crazy. But even though this is placed in the 50s, it is still relevant today. So here we go with chapter one. The Earth and the Salamander. It was a pleasure to burn it was a special pleasure to see things eaten, to see things blackened and changed. With a brass nozzle in his fists, with his great python spitting its venomous kerosene upon the world, the blood pounded in his head, and his hands were the hands of some amazing conductor playing all the symphonies of blazing and burning to bring down the tatters and charcoal ruins of history. With his symbolic helmet numbered 451, on his stoled head, and his eyes all orange, flame with the thought of what came next. 
he flicked the igniter and the house jumped up in a gorging fire that burned the evening sky red and yellow and black. He strode in a swarm of fireflies. He wanted above all, like the old joke, to shove a marshmallow on a stick in the furnace while the flapping pigeon winged books died on the porch and lawn of the house while the books went up in sparkling whirls and blew away on a wind turned dark with burning montag grinned the fierce grin of all men signed and driven back by flame he knew that when he returned to the firehouse he might wink at himself a minstrel man burnt corked in the mine in the mire sorry in the mirror later going to sleep he would feel the fiery smile still gripped by his face muscles in the dark it never went away that smile it never ever went away as long as he remembered he hung up his black beetle colored helmet and shined it he hung his flame-proof jacket neatly. He showered luxuriously, and then, whistling, hands in pockets, walked across the upper floor of the fire station and fell down the hole. At the last moment, when disaster seemed positive, he pulled his hands from his pockets and broke his fall by grasping the golden pole. He slid to a squeaking halt the, few, the heels one inch from the concrete floor downstairs. He walked out of the fire station and along the midnight street toward the subway where the silent air propelled train slid soundlessly down its lubricated flute, flue in the earth and let him out with a great puff of warm air until the cream tiled escalator rising to the suburb whistling he let the escalator waft him into the still night air he walked toward the corner thinking little at all about nothing in particular before he reached the corner however he slowed as if a wind had sprung up from nowhere as if someone had called his name the last few nights he had had the most uncertain feelings about the sidewalk just around the corner here moving in the starlight toward his house he had felt that a moment prior to his making the turns someone had been there the air seemed charged with a special calm as if someone had waited there quietly and only a moment before he came simply turned to a shadow and led him through. Perhaps his nose detect, detected a faint perfume. Perhaps the skin on the backs of his hands on his face felt the temperature rise at this one spot where a person standing might raise the immediate atmosphere, 10 degrees for an instant. There was no understanding it. Each time he made the turn, he saw only the white unused buckling sidewalk with perhaps on one night something vanishing swiftly across a lawn before he could focus his eyes or speak but now tonight he slowed almost to a stop his inner mind reaching out to turn the corner for him had heard the faintest whisper breathing or was the atmosphere compressed merely by someone standing very quietly there waiting he turned the corner the autumn leaves blew over the moonlit pavement in such a way as to make the girl who was moving there seem fixed to a sliding walk letting the motion of the wind and the leaves carry her forward her head was half bent to watch her shoes stir the circling leaves. Her face was slender and milk white, and in it was a kind of gentle hunger that touched 
over everything with tireless curiosity. It was a look almost of pale surprise. The dark eyes were so fixed to the world that no move escaped them. Her dress was white and it whispered. He almost thought he heard the motion of her hands as she walked and the infinitely small sound now the white stir of her face turning when she discovered she was a moment away from a man who stood in the middle of the pavement waiting. The trees overhead made a great sound of letting down their dry rain. The girl stopped and looked as if she might pull back in. Surprise, but instead stood regarding Montag with eyes so dark and shining and alive that he felt he had said something quite wonderful, but he knew his mouth had only moved to say hello. And then when she seemed hypnotized by the salamander on his arm, and the phoenix disc on his chest he spoke again of course he said you're our neighbor aren't you and you must be she raised her eyes from his professional symbols the firemen her voice trailed off how oddly you say that i'd i'd have known it with my eyes shut she said slowly what the smell of kerosene my wife always complains he laughed you never wash it off completely no you don't she said in awe he felt she was walking in a circle about him turning him end for end shaking him quietly and emptying his pockets without once moving herself Kerosene, he said, because the silence had lengthened, is nothing but perfume to me. Does it seem like that, really? Of course, why not? She gave herself time to think of it. I don't know. She turned to face the sidewalk, going toward their homes. Do you mind if I walk back with you? I'm Clarice McLean. Clarice, Guy Montag, come along. What are you doing out so late wandering around? How old are you? They walked in the warm, cool, blowing night on the silvered pavement, and there was the faintest breath of fresh apricots and strawberries in the air. And he looked around and realized this was quite impossible so late in the year. There was only the girl walking with him now, her face bright as snow in the moonlight, and he knew she was working. His question around, seeking the best answer she could possibly give. Well, she said, I'm 17 and I'm crazy. My uncle says the two always go together. When people ask your age, He said, always say 17 and insane. Isn't this a nice time of night to walk? I like to smell things and look at things and sometimes stay up all night walking and watch the sunrise. They walked on again in silence. And finally, she said thoughtfully, you know, I'm not afraid of you at all. He was surprised. Why should you be? So many people are afraid of firemen. I mean, but you're just a man after all. He saw himself in her eyes, suspended in two shining drops of bright water, himself dark and tiny in fine detail, the lines about his mouth, everything there, as if her eyes were two miraculous bits of violet amber and might capture and hold him intact. Her face turned to him now was fragile milk crystal with a soft and constant light in it. It was not the hysterical light of electricity, but what? 
with the strangely comfortable and rare and gently flattering light of the candle. One time as a child in a power failure, his mother had found and lit a last candle and there had been a brief hour of rediscovery of such illumination that space lost its vast dimension and drew comfortably around them. And they, mother and son, alone transformed, hoping that the power might not come on again too soon. And then Clarice McLean said, do you mind if I ask how long you've worked at being a fireman? Since I was 20, 10 years ago. Do you ever read any of the books you burn? <laughs> That's against the law. Oh, of course. It's fine work. Monday, burn, Millay. Wednesday, Whitman. Friday, Faulkner. Burn them to ashes, then burn the ashes. That's our official slogan. They walked still further, and the girl said, Is it true that long ago firemen put fires out instead of going to start them? No. Houses have always been fireproof. Take my word for it. Strange. I heard once that a long time ago, houses used to burn by accident, and they needed firemen to stop the flames. <laughs> She glanced quickly over. Why are you laughing? I don't know. He started to laugh again and stopped. Why? You laugh when I haven't been funny and you'll answer right off. You never stop to think what I've asked you. He stopped walking. You are an odd one, he said, looking at her. Haven't you any respect? I don't mean to be insulting. It's just I love to watch people too much, I guess. Well, doesn't this mean anything to you? He tapped the num num numerals 451, stitched on his char-colored sleeve. Yes, she whispered. She increased her pace. Have you ever watched the jet cars racing on the boulevards down that way? You're changing the subject. I sometimes think drivers don't know what grass is or flowers because they never see them slowly, she said. If you showed a driver a green blur, oh yes, he'd say that's grass. A pink blur, that's a rose garden. White blurs are houses. Brown blurs are cows. My uncle drove slowly on a highway once. He drove 40 miles an hour and they jailed him for two days. Isn't that funny and, and sad too? You think too many things, said Montag uneasily. I rarely watch the parlor walls or go to races or fun parks. So I've lots of time for crazy thoughts, I guess. Have you seen the 200 foot long billboards in the country beyond town? Did you know that once billboards were only 20 feet long? But cars started rushing by so quickly they had to stretch the advertising out so it would last. I didn't know that, Montag laughed abruptly. Bet I know something else you don't. There's dew on the grass in the morning. He suddenly couldn't remember if he had known this or not. And it made him quite irritable. And if you look, she nodded at the sky, there's a man in the moon. He hadn't looked for a long time. They walked the rest of the way in silence. Hers thoughtful, his a kind of clenching and uncomfortable silence in which he shot her accusing glances. 
when they reached her house, all its lights were blazing. Once going on, Montag had rarely seen that many house lights. Oh, just my mother and father and uncle sitting around talking. It's like being a pedestrian, only rarer. Oh, sorry, rarer. My uncle was arrested another time. Did I tell you? For being a pedestrian. Oh, we're most peculiar. But what do you talk about? She laughed at this. <laughs> Good night. She started up her walk. Then she seemed to remember something and came back to look at him with wonder and curiosity. Are you happy? She said. Am I what? He cried. But she was gone. Running in the moonlight, her front door shut gently. Happy of all the nonsense. <laughs> he stopped laughing. He put his hand into the glove hole of his front door and let it know his, his touch. The front door slid open. Of course I'm happy. What does she think? I'm not? He asked the quiet rooms. He stood looking up at the ventilator grill in the hall and suddenly remembered that something lay hidden behind the grill, something that seemed to peer down at him now. He moved his eyes quickly away with a strange meeting on a strange night. He remembered nothing like it save one afternoon. A year ago, when he had met an old man in the park, they had talked. Montag shook his head. He looked at a blank wall. The girl's face was there, really quite beautiful in memory. Astonishing, in fact. She had a very thin face like the dial of a small clock seen faintly in a dark room in the middle of a night when you waken to see the time and see the clock telling you the hour and the minute and the second with a white silence and a glowing all certainty and knowing what it has to tell of the night passing swiftly on toward further darkness but moving also toward a new sun what asked montag of that other self the subconscious idiot that ran babbling at times quiet independent of will habit and conscience he glanced back at the wall how like a mirror too her face impossible for how many people did you know that refracted your own light to you people were more often he searched for a smile found one in his work torches blazing away until they whiffed out how rarely did other people's faces take of you and throw back to you your own expression your own innermost trembling thought what incredible power of identification the girl had she was like the eager watcher of a marionette show, anticipating each flicker of an eyelid, each gesture of his hand, each flick of a finger, the moment before it began. How long had they walked together? Three minutes? Five? Yet how large that time seemed now. How immense a figure she was on the stage before him. What a shadow she threw on the wall with her slender body. He felt that if his eye inched, itched, she might blink. And if the muscles of his jaw stretched imperc imperceptibly, she would yawn long before he would. Why, he thought now that I think of it she almost seemed to be waiting for me there in the street so damned late at night he opened the bedroom door it was like coming into the cold marble room of a mausoleum after the moon has set 
complete darkness, not a hint of silver world outside. The windows tightly shut the chamber, a tomb world where no sound from the great city would penetrate. The room was not empty. He listened. The little mosquito delicate dancing hum in the air. The electric murmur of a hidden wasp snug in its special pink warm nest. The music was almost loud enough so he could follow the tune. He felt his smile slide away, melt, fold over and down on itself like a tallow skin. Like the stuff of a, of a fantastic candle burning too long and now collapsing and now blown out. Darkness. He was not happy. He was not happy. He said the words to himself. He recognized this as the true state of affairs. He wore his happiness like a mask, and the girl had run off across the lawn with the mask, and there was no way of going to knock on her door and ask for it back. Without turning on the light, he imagined how this room would look. His wife stretched on the bed, uncovered and cold like a body displayed on the lid of a tomb. Her eyes fixed to ceiling, fixed to the ceiling by invisible threads of steel, immovable, and in her ears the little seashells, the thimble, radios temp tamped right, tamped tight, excuse me, and an electronic ocean of sound of music and talk and music and talk coming in coming in on the shore of her unsleeping mind the room was indeed empty every night the waves came in and bore her off on their great tides of sound floating her wide eyed toward morning. There had been no night the last two years that Mildred had not swum that sea and had not gladly gone down in it for the third time. The room was cold, but not the, not the less he felt that he could not breathe. He did not wish to open the drapes and open the French windows for he did not want the moon to come into the room. So with the feeling of a man who will die in the next hour for lack of air, he felt his way toward his open, separate, and therefore cold bed. An instant before his foot hit the object on the floor, he knew he would hit such an object. It was not unlike the feeling he had experienced before turning the corner and almost knocking the girl down. His foot sending vibrations ahead received back echoes of the small barrier across its path, even as the foot swung. His foot kicked the object, gave a dull clink, and slid off in darkness. He stood very straight and listened to the person on the dark bed in the completely futile featureless night the breath coming out the nostrils was so faint it stirred only the furthest fringes of life a small leaf a black feather a single fiber of hair he still did not want outside light he pulled out his igniter felt the salamander etched on its silver disc gave it a flick Two moonstones looked up at him in the light of his small, handheld fire. Two pale moonstones buried in a creek of clear watch over with the life of the world ran, not touching them. Mildred! Her face was like a snow-covered island upon which rain might fall, but it felt no rain over which clouds might pass their moving shadows but she felt no shadow there was only the singing of the thimble wasp in her taint, tamped shut eye, ears and her eyes all glass and breath going in and out softly faintly 
in and out her nostrils and her not caring whether it came or went, went or came. The object he had sent, tumbling with his foot, now glinted under the edge of his own bed. The small crystal bottle of sleeping tablets, which earlier today had been filled with thirty capsules, and which now lay uncapped and empty in the light of the tiny flare. As he stood there, the sky over the house screamed. There was a tremendous ripping sound, as if two giant hands had torn ten thousand miles of black linen down the seam. Montag was in, was cut in half. He felt his chest chopped down and split apart the jet bombers going over, going over, going over, one, two, one, two, one, two. Six of them, nine of them, twelve of them, one and one and one and another and another and another did all the screaming for him. He opened his own mouth and let their shriek come down and out between his ba his barred teeth. The house shook. The flare went out in his hand. The moonstones vanished. He felt his hand plunge toward the telephone. The jets were gone. He felt his lips move, brushing the mouthpiece of the phone. Emergency hospital. A terrible whisper. He felt that the stars had been pulverized by the second of the black jets and that in the morning the earth would be covered with their dust like a strange snow. That was his idiot thought as he stood sh shivering in the dark and let his lips go on moving and moving. They had this machine. They had two machines, really. One of them slid down into your stomach like a black cobra, down an echoing well looking for all the old water and the old time gathered there. It drank up the green matter that flowed to the top in a slow boil. Did it drink of the darkness? Did it suck out all the poisonous accumulated with the, with the years? It fed in silence with an occasional sound of inner suffocation and blind searching. It had an eye. The impersonal operator of the machine could, by wearing a special optical helmet, gaze into the soul of the person whom he was pumping out. What did the eye see? He did not say. He saw but did not see what the eye saw. The entire operation was not unlike the digging of a trench in one's yard. The woman on the bed was no more than a hard stratum of marble they had reached. Go on anyway, shove the board down, slush up the emptiness. If such a thing could be brought out in the throb of the suction snake. The operator stood smoking a cigarette. The other machine was working too. The other machine operated by an equally impersonal fi fellow in non-stainable reddish brown coveralls. This machine pumped all the blood from the body and replaced it with fresh blood and serum. Got to clean them out both ways, said the operator standing over the silent woman. No use getting the stomach if you don't clean the blood. Leave that stuff in the blood and the blood hits the brain like a mallet. Bang! A couple thousand times and the brain just gives up, just quits. Stop it, said Montag. I was just saying, said the operator. Are you done, said Montag. They shut the machines up tight. We're done. His anger did not even touch them. They stood with the cigarette smoke curling around their noses and into their eyes without making them blink or squint. That's 50 bucks. First, why don't you tell me if she'll be all right? Sure, she'll be okay. We got all the mean stuff right in our suitcase here. 
It can't get at her now. As I said, you take out the old and put in the new and you're okay. Neither of you is an MD. Why didn't they send an MD from emergency? Hell, the operator's cigarette moved on his lip. We get these cases nine or ten a night. Got so many starting a few years ago. We had the special machines built with the optical lens, of course. That was new. The rest is ancient. You don't need an MD. Case like this, all you need is two handymen. Clean up the problem in half an hour. Look, he started for the door. We gotta go. Just had another call on the old ear thimble. Ten blocks from here. Someone else just jumped off the cap of a pillbox. Call if you need us again. Keep her quiet. We got a con contraceptive in her. She'll wake up hungry. So, so, so long. And the men with the cigarettes in their straight line mouths, the men with the eyes of puff adders, took up their load of machine and tube, their case of liquid melancholy, and the slow dark sludge of nameless stuff, and strolled out the door. Montag sank down into a chair and looked at this woman. Her eyes were closed now, gently, and he put out his hand to feel the warmness of breath on his palm. Mildred, he said at last. There are too many of us, he thought. There are a billion there are billions of us, and that's too many. Nobody knows anyone. Strangers come and violate you. Strangers come and cut your heart out. Strangers come and take your blood. Good God. Who were those men? I never saw them before in my life. Half an hour passed. The bloodstream in this woman was new, and it seemed to have done a new thing to her. Her cheeks were very pink, and her lips were very fresh and full of color, and they looked soft and relaxed. Someone else's blood there. If, one, if only someone else's flesh and brain and memory... If only they could have taken her mind along to the dry cleaners and emptied the pockets and steamed and cleansed it and reblocked it and brought it back in the morning. If only. He got up and put back the drapes and opened the windows wide to let the night air in. It was two o'clock in the morning. Was it only an hour ago? Clarice McLean in the street and him coming in in the dark room, and his foot kicking the little crystal bottle. Only an hour, but the word had melted down and sprung up in a new and colorless form. Laughter blew across the moon-colored lawn. The house of Clarice, and her father, and mother, and the uncle who smiled so quietly and so earnestly. Above all, their laughter was relaxed and hearty, and not forced in any way coming from the house that was so brightly lit this late at night while all the other houses were kept to themselves in darkness montag heard the voices talking 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 giving talking weaving re reweaving their hypnotic web montag moved out through the french windows and crossed the lawn without even thinking of it he stood outside the talking house, in the shadows, thinking he might even tap on their door, and whispered, Let me come in. I won't say anything. I just want to listen. What is it you're saying? But instead, he stood there, very cold, his face a mask of ice, listening to a man's voice. The uncle? Moving along at any easy pace, well, after all this is the age of the disposable tissue. Blow your nose on a person, wad them, flush them away. Reach for another, blow wad, blow wad flush. Everyone using everyone else. 
Texas coat trails. How are you supposed to root for the home team when you don't even have a program or know the names? For that matter, what color jerseys are they wearing as they trot out on the field? Montag moved back to his own house, left the window wide, checked Mildred, tucked the covers about her carefully, and then lay down with the moonlight on his cheekbones and on the frowning ridges in his brow, with the moonlight distilled in each eye to form a silver cataract there. One drop of rain, Clarice, another drop, Mildred, a third, the uncle, a fourth, the fire tonight. One, Clarice, two, Mildred, three, uncle, four, fire. One, Mildred, two, Clarice, one, two, three, four, five. Clarice, Mildred, uncle, fire, sleeping, tablets, men, disposable tissue, cock coattails, blow, wad, flush. Clarice, Mildred, uncle, fire, tablets, tissues, blow, wad, flush. One, two, three, one, two, three, rain. The storm, the uncle laughing, thunder falling downstairs, the whole world pouring down, the fire gushing up in a volcano, all rushing on down, around in a spouting roar and revering stream toward morning. I don't know anything anymore, he said, and let a sleep lozenge dissolve on his tongue. At nine in the morning, Mildred's bed was empty. Montag got up quickly, his heart pumping, and ran down the hall and stopped at the kitchen door. Toast popped out of the silver toaster, was seized by a spidery metal hand that drenched it with metal melted butter. Mildred watched the toast delivered to her plate. She had both ears plugged with electronic bees that were humming the hour away. She looked up suddenly, saw him, and nodded. You all right? he asked. She was an expert at, at lip reading from ten years of apprenticeship at seashell ear thimbles. She nodded again. She set the toaster clicking away at another piece of bread. Montag sat down. His wife said, I don't know why I should be so hungry. You, I'm hungry. Last night, he began, didn't sleep well, feel terrible, she said. God, I'm hungry. I can't figure it. Last night, he said again. She washed his lips ca casually. What about last night? Don't you remember? What? Did we have a wild party or something? Feel like I've, ha I've had a hangover. God, I'm hungry. Who was here? A few people, he said. That's what I thought, she chewed her toast. Some sore stomach, but I'm hungry as all get out. Hope I didn't do anything foolish at the party. No, he said quietly. The toaster spidered out a piece of buttered bread for him. He held it in his hand, feeling obligated. You don't look so hot yourself said his wife. We'll read one more page. In the late afternoon, it rained and the entire world was dark gray. He stood in the hall of his house, putting on his badge with the orange salamander burning across it. He stood looking up at the air conditioning vent in the hall for a long time. His wife in the TV parlor paused long enough from reading her script to glance up. Hey, she said, the man's thinking. Yes, he said, I wanted to talk to you, he paused. You took all the pills in your bottle last night. Oh, I wouldn't do that, 
she said, surprised. The bottle was empty. I wouldn't do a thing like that. Why would I do a thing like that? She said. Maybe you took two pills and forgot and took two more and forgot again and took two more and were so dopey you kept right on until you had 30 or 40 of them in you. Heck, she said. What would I want to go and do a silly thing like that for? I don't know, he said. She was quite obviously waiting for him to go. I didn't do that, she said. Never in a billion years. That's what the lady said. She turned back to her script. What's on this afternoon, he asked tiredly. She didn't look up from the script again. Well, this is a play. Comes on the wall-to-wall -wall circuit in ten minutes. They mailed me my part this morning. I sent in some box tops. They write the script with one part missing. It's a new idea. The homemaker, that's me, is the missing part. When it comes time for the missing lines, they all look at me out of three walls and I say the lines. Here, for instance, the man says, what do you think of this whole idea, Helen? And he looks at me sitting here center stage, see? And I say, I say, she paused and ran her fingers under a line on the script. I think that's fine. And then they go on with the play until he says, do you agree to that, Helen? And I say, I sure do. Isn't that fun, guy? He stood in the hall looking at her. It's sure fun, she said. What's the play about? I just told you, there are these people named Bob and Ruth and Helen. Oh, it's really fun. It'll be even more fun when we can afford to have the fourth wall installed. How long you figure before we save up and get the fourth wall torn out and a fourth wall TV put in? It's only $2,000. That's one third of my yearly pay. It's only $2,000, she replied. And I should think you'd consider me sometimes. If we had a fourth wall, why, I'd be just like the room wasn't ours at all, but all kinds of exotic people's rooms. We could do without a few things. We're already doing without a few things to pay for the third wall. It was put in only two months ago, remember? Is that all it was? She sat looking at him for a long moment. Well, goodbye, dear. Goodbye, he said. He stood and turned around. Does it have a happy ending? I haven't read that far. He walked over, read the last page, nodded, folded the script, and handed it back to her. He walked out of the house into the rain. And we're going to stop there for today. I just got to say, his wife just uh, almost, well, no, she committed suicide and then talking about a TV. <laughs> it, but isn't that kind of like our society, how it is right now? Like, we're so caught up in the screens that we forget what's really happening sometimes. And what about Clarice? I agree. I mean, she, they, she is considered odd by Montag and everybody, but she's not that odd. Everybody is so glued to their screens nowadays, they don't even get a chance to go outside or, like, see people's faces and experience what grass is and what are, what cows are and what, what, what a bee does or what a butterfly does. I mean, we are so, I know I'm, here I am talking because uh, I'm on YouTube live. I'm in front of a screen reading to you all. But it's like, how sad is that? That that's the only communication we have nowadays. I mean, I remember a time when this wasn't a thing. I'd actually go see people. I'd have to, If I wanted to communicate with somebody or see somebody, I had to go to the mall. But now malls are dying. Um, 
I know my mom told me um, my brother would take me to the mall to pick up girls because I'm a little girl. But now everything's at your fingertips, you know, and we get so caught up in our screens that we forget the world around us. My professor, before he passed away, told me, you know, he, he sat me down in class one time. Oh, all of us. And he said, you guys are so glued to your phones. Why don't you get the world around you? Like, just did you guys see, notice the sky today? How beautiful it was today? And I raised my hand. I, like I said, yeah, I noticed that. I wasn't on my phone. Like, I need to walk where I'm going. <laughs> I need to look where I'm going. I guess I'm kind of old school, but I'm a millennial old schooler. But. How, how many of y'all have even stopped to notice the sky today or talk to actually talk to somebody face to face? I ain't talking about social media, but like just actually had a conversation with somebody or spent quality time with somebody. Watched a movie together. I know it's a screen, but you're with somebody physically. It makes you think. And I know you say, well, aren't you going to read the next chapter? Well, I forgot. It's been a really long time since I've seen uh, Fahrenheit 451. Well, I mean, sorry. Well, yeah, I've seen the movie too, but I mean, read it. It's been a long time, but it's divided in three sections. But I want to, so like for this book, we're just going to do an hour a day. But we're keeping a chapter a day. But this is an hour for this book. How it's formatted, we're doing an hour a day. Because I forgot, it's one big chunk. It's, he doesn't divide it in chapters. It's like, let me show you. I forgot. <laughs> see, I don't know if you can see that. It's divided in three ch three chunks. Yikes. So, we're gonna, for this book, we're doing an hour a day. And then after we read this book, it will be Animal Farm. And if you would like for me to read 1984, because that boy is long. <laughs> long. Holy cow, it's long. So um, let me know. And let me know what you guys think. And I will see you all tomorrow. So until next time, this is Miss Petal saying a chapter a day. Keeps the ignorance at bay and imagination at play. Good night.